Hello everyone. This is the Summer Masterclass Series, July 2021 of Canon Music Camp. The premier comprehensive music camp in the Southwest, Canon Music Camp is a three week music filled retreat in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. It has an intensive college preparatory work in performance and music theory. Welcome to the Violin Masterclass. I'm Dr. Nancy Bargerstock, Professor of Violin at the Hayes School of Music at Appalachian State University. My job includes both teaching and performing. Some of you may wonder what a Masterclass is. Masterclass is a open arena of learning where a master teacher works with one or more students and the spectators, who may also be players, players, even though they may not perform that day, they also have the opportunity to learn. Let's go forward with this today's topics, the goals of our masterclass today. Um, I will be helping you have some ideas about how to practice better in the summertime when your schedule is much more open, much more variable. I will also help you have some idea about how to prepare as you approach the beginning of the school year where you may be needing to get your playing back in order after a summer relaxing time off. Summer care and maintenance of your instrument, a wooden instrument like the violin, we have to be careful to keep it out of hot temperatures and in the winter, of course, cold temperatures also to watch the humidity. As you prepare for your up upcoming school year and the North Carolina State uh, Orchestra auditions, uh, the, we will talk about the uh, solo piece and uh, touch a little bit on the scales and arpeggios that are required for that. In the Viotti Concerto, there are certain small points that we can talk about, not only how to practice it, but the style of the performance of a piece from the classical era. And at the very end, there'll be a, a recording um, that you can access on YouTube for your own benefit. So it is a challenging time in the summer to find the time and the place for your regular summertime practice. Sometimes we can even, if we have too many people in the house, because people are not at school um, or, or um, parents or grandparents are visiting or cousins, you might find that you are less apt to go grab your violin and play. But if you need to find another space, if the weather's nice, you could go outside or on a screened in porch to do your practice um, or the basement, if it's nice and cool, if you happen to have one, um, trying to, touch the instrument five days out of every week would be a good idea and even 20 minutes in one day is better than not touching the instrument at all to keep your fingers flexible and remembering where those positions are have you ever considered coming to music camp that's a great way to up your skill set and also to make some really good friends um, Canon Camp will be in person back on the campus of Appalachian State in the summer of 2022. And we look forward, if you haven't already been a camper, of, of seeing you uh, your, and live and in person as a regular camper there. When you go to prepare for your return to school before, maybe two weeks before the first day of classes, you should be getting your violin out every day and trying to get your stamina and strengthening your coordination skills so that when you land in your school and in your orchestra or your ensembles that you won't be uh, with a sore back uh, you won't be trying to keep up with the rest of the kids that maybe had a better uh, go at practicing so Planning ahead and finding time for your practice is really super important. Write your practice time into your daily class schedule when you get back into school. 
if you have a study hall and they allow you to go practice in one of the music practice modules or in a, a classroom if it's unoccupied, I would say that would be a wonderful way of getting ahead. Um, it's like homework. Otherwise, we have to take it, the violin out after we get home from, from class. So uh, find a good time of day, if you can, and a quiet location to do your practice. Stick to a schedule. If you know that on Tuesday, you always have that study hall at the same time, see if you can write violin into that spot on your schedule. Organize all your materials, have it collected, your music, your music stand, if you need to have one, a metronome, a tuner, <clears throat> a pencil, and uh, that really will bring your learning into the most uh, accurate progression. Decide as you're unpacking your violin what you plan to accomplish that day that you're practice, or always have a plan that by the weekend when you have that rehearsal or that um, goal to go like play for your teacher, if you have a private teacher, that you always are, are imagining what your very short term or even long term goals are. Write down your goals uh, in an assignment book or on a, some kind of paper that you always keep with you and see if you can stick to them. When you practice, first start out with a slow warm up. Uh, you might use scales and arpeggios. They are the rudiments of much of the music that we play. It would be good to practice different keys also um, and to have a good sense of shifting and tone as we are practicing that. Uh, focus on your posture. Is your bow really connecting at the good sounding point of the string? Um, your intonation and tone. This, these are all important basics that you could be focusing on as you warm up. Then switch over to an etude or a solo piece. Uh, the solo piece that we're going to see today is going to be, if you are in North Carolina, they ask for that audition. It happens mid-January. So if you start practicing it, you may find that you want to put it to rest and then pick it up again later in the fall or towards December. Um, and you will see that it will have become really your friend if you get a good early start on it. Uh, and finish your, your daily practice by looking at some of your orchestra or ensemble music. Um, and also, when you're not practicing, it counts as practice if you're listening to recordings. And maybe you can find some of the music that you're playing uh, via the YouTube channel. And there, the, many students are putting up their own recordings. You might be one of those too. Care and maintenance of your violin. As we said, we have to try to find a stable climate, both of temperature and humidity. Uh, as far as the hairs on your bow, if they aren't very white, they probably have become soiled. Uh, we try to keep our fingers off the hairs because that keeps them from gripping the string. So keeping very clean hairs. Also, if you don't have a full complement of hairs here, it's about 50 hairs on a violin bow. If they start falling out, then they or breaking, it may be time to get your bow rehaired. The maintenance of the violin, you'll need to take it to a violin repair person. We don't want any cracks or open seams. We keep up with that maintenance. Also, if you have a shoulder rest, you want to be sure that the feet on the shoulder rest are that the rubber is really good there and that you're not making scratches in the varnish. Um, that would be defacing the, and you would actually be losing some value on your instrument. We have to protect the instrument. The varnish helps protect the instrument. Um, as far as strings, if we have fresh strings, I change my strings. I buy kind of expensive strings, uh, but I change them once a year. And they really, when I put the new ones on, I realize, oh yeah, that's right. They had lost some resonance. They weren't, the pitches weren't really true. And that's what we 
call that the strings with time, they go false. So uh, fresh strings, if you want to start the year or if you have a big concert, you might want to change your strings just maybe a week before the concert so that they're at their absolute best. Now, if you have an audition, let's say for the Allstate Orchestra or for seating, uh, sometimes if you go to a summer camp, the very first or second day, they're going to ask to hear everyone play something. Um, so if you know in advance that you're going to be on the spot to play an audition, uh, you need to be practicing. There is nothing that's going to supplant that. All the talent in the world, you still have to practice. It's a physical, athletic endeavor. And you have to get the reaction times and the muscles strong and uh, flexibility also. So if you're practicing a, a specific audition piece, I would still warm up and maybe play an etude and then get to your solo piece eventually but to have all the facilities working by the time you get to the solo piece, which is probably more complicated. Uh, work systematically in sections when you begin your, your practice. Uh, take the first three lines, the first phrase, first measure, and play it over and over again until you get it exactly as you would like, and then go on to the next section. Determine where the difficult spots are because all Place, all measures are not created equal. Some are harder, more difficult. They go to the edges of your technical ability. They push you, hopefully. And so um, if you wanted to, you could record yourself, if you have a smartphone or some other recording device, and listen back. And, and that's like being with a teacher, because you can listen and be objective and say, oh, that spot, that sounds a little out of tune. or Oh, I get slower there. I can tell now because I'm not the one playing it. You can be more objective. Okay, fix one problem at a time. Try not to do four things at once, just one thing. Let's say we're gonna fix the intonation. Okay, then you fix the intonation. Then we're going to fix the rhythm on that same measure. Maybe we weren't holding the long note long enough or whatever the problem was. Uh, at articulation, maybe also when we've already got the intonation and the rhythm fixed, then we're going to think about, oh, the articulation. Is it staccato? Is it legato? Do I need to sustain the bow more? Uh, and then there's the tone, and that would be adding vibrato, or is my dynamic correct? And those are like stages of repair that shouldn't necessarily be dealt with exactly at the same time. Work them out one at a time, systematically. On the day of the audition, again, we know our music, but you still must warm up every day slowly like it's the beginning, just like an athlete, just like the football players on the field before the game or the baseball players before the game. You've seen them. You are a player maybe of a sport and you know what I'm talking about. After you're warmed up, then play every note of the piece that you're going to perform in the audition or in the concert. Play it through in the correct order and be thinking very systematically. It's all of those thoughts in a row that are the, the string that ties it all together. So if you can keep your concentration and play through every note slowly and exactly in tune and proportionally rhythmic and with good tone, then when you need it in the performance, you will have just done that, but you would have time to anticipate it. Before you walk into the room to audition, you have to be organized with your thoughts. So I would say, maybe it's not a good time to get on the phone and start talking to one of your friends or be involved in something else that's not related to your performance. You have to bring your focus to that moment when you would put your bow on the string and you're going to begin to sing your song or tell your story through the music. So avoid distracting activities and then afterwards, then you can 
go play volleyball, whatever. You can have a, a, a night out. Go have a party with your friend and celebrate. But before the performance, it's like anything we do that, that requires great concentration, we must focus and bring our attention to that one thing we're going to do. Preparing for sight reading. Oftentimes in an audition, you are asked to sight read. And yes, you can practice sight reading. In fact, there is a website called sightreadingfactory.com. Maybe you have seen it, but it has various levels of difficulty. Uh, you can sort of custom design your own sight reading examples, except you don't know the computer makes it and sends you. You can decide whether it's going to be four measures long or eight measures long or 16 measures long, whether it's going to be a, 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 in, a in a triple meter or a four, four meter, if it's going to be in uh, six flats or C major, you can design it and they will give you, and then you can up the ante and make it a little more difficult and a little, it has at least six levels. Um, so it's, it's very interesting, and I have used it in my studio with my college students. I had a, a Wednesday night uh, quiz that they had to submit a sight reading example that they had um, to record and put into our uh, forum for discussion, and they got grades. It was fun. Um, Anyway, before you play an unknown piece, there are a few things that you can do to set you up for success. Um, first of all, sight reading is like what we would do if we were sitting in an orchestra and the orchestra director had put new music on everybody's stand and we're, here we go. One, two, three, here we go. And we start to play. And you may not catch every note, but any note you you drop, maybe the person sitting next to you will play that note. So the music keeps going, no matter what, the rhythm doesn't stop. You just grab onto the next thing and keep on going and never look over your shoulder. What happened in the last measure, we're just gonna forget about it. Always keeping forward, setting a tempo and staying always looking forward. So before you start to play, if you're given us, you know, um, 30 seconds or a minute, you can scan over the music, take a look at it, and quickly note the meter or the time signature and the key signature. And now we're thinking our scales, like two sharps, D major, okay, I know those notes, all right? And then examine if you see any kind of rhythmic thing that looks a little more complex. Uh, see if you can tap it out or, or figure out where the beats are and, and solve that just intellectually without hearing it or playing it, okay? And then look for if there are repeated passages that you might be able to, uh, oh, I already played that. It's, it's like a recycling of music that you just played two lines above. So that would be good to look for similar places and that way you can sort of, uh, rest your laurels or fix it. If it didn't come out perfectly the first time, I've got another chance of it on the third line. Uh, motivic patterns, like rhythms that are repeated. The notes may change, but the rhythm uh, motive is the shortest rhythmic and melodic unit. So if you find patterns like that, see if you can recycle those ideas. It helps the sight reading. And then before you start, Sing in your head the very beginning measure. See if that can get you started on the right foot. All right. And yes, we can practice sight reading. The more we do it, it's a skill, the better we get at it. All right. Now, coming into the winter season, we need to be practicing uh, for all state orchestra auditions. No matter what state you come from, they will have scales and arpeggios as a requirement, because there, as we said before, it's sort of the fundamentals that pieces are written on. So um, there is a PDF of the violin scales uh, embedded on this slide. I, I am not sure if you're gonna be able to find them exactly there, but they do exist. Um, and uh, 
we can uh, link you up with them if your uh, public school teacher doesn't offer them. Um, the scales in North Carolina are C major, G major, D major, A major, B flat major, all three octave scales, uh, F major in two octaves, and then any melodic minor scale of your choice in three octaves. As well, the corresponding tonic arpeggios. Scales are slurred in four notes per bow, and arpeggios are slurred three notes per bow. Great warm up. We might as well be practicing for the audition and warming up every day. Now, the North Carolina All State Orchestra in January 2022 is when the audition is for the All State Orchestra. It this year is going to be J.B. Villotti's Concerto Number no. 23, the first movement the first two pages of violin solo. There is a link here with a PDF of the music. And I will be showing you this here and we'll be talking about some specifics. Meanwhile, your goal on this piece is to play with rhythmic accuracy, a steady tempo, uh, Viotti was an Italian of the classical era, and um, rhythm was really important in the, the um, crystal clear writing of the time was what really demands a very clean technique. As well, because he's an Italian and opera comes from Italy, there is a lot of opportunity to show your singing tone and to play with vibrato. Now, one thing to note is this piece, this first movement, goes into actually eighth position. It goes through all the positions. And they're rather stepwise how they're either coming down or they're going up. In it, it, It's kind of sequential. And that makes it a really good piece for students who are learning to do better shifting. When you are shifting up through positions, let's be sure that we are trying to pull the bow closer to the bridge. That is because as we go higher, the string becomes shorter and it's a proportion as to where that sweet spot, as the jazzers call it, where the sounding point is. So if I was to play, Now, when I play the E, I'm going to play even a little closer to the bridge. Now we repeat the theme. string on the second time that we play that theme that's in the lower octave uh, that's in measure 92 here when I went up on the D string I had to be sure that my bow came much closer or I didn't have a clear sound on those the E D both times that I have that dotted figure so be sure to pull your bow closer to the bridge and that'll make the sound consistent. Now, another place uh, practicing where I just arrived with my playing is the 16th note sections section where it is in measure 99 to 108. We can play actually a section, as I said before, when we practice, we should do segments at a time. Here is measure 99 where we have 16th notes. We could 
practice that section with some variations. And I have included here ideas for practice. You could practice instead of all separate bows, you could play four slurred. <laughs> could also play slower. The tempo of this movement is typically 100 to the quarter note, but we could actually slow it down to make sure that we're playing really in tune. Uh, that was the variation one. We could also do two slurred and two slurred all the way through, all the way through till the, the end of the 16th notes. And then we have uh, variation three would be two slurred and two separate. <laughs> It's a good practice to use variations. You're trying to make it, I think, a little more complicated. And when you go back and you play it just regular, just the way it was always intended to be played, you'll find it comes out more easily. Also, if you do, look at this. Here's four slurred, four separates, or four separates and four slurred. So that would be reversing the pattern. That would be... Uh, <laughs> And then two slurred, two separate, three slurred, one separate, one separate, three slurred. Oh my gosh, how about eight slurred, eight separate? That's getting pretty, pretty fancy. But if I do all those variations and then I go back and I play it all separate bows, just as he wrote, Mr. Viotti, you will see that your playing has really improved. You've tricked yourself into playing that segment 10 extra times. And that way you actually improve. And tomorrow it'll be a little easier. Now, if you can play it with spotlessly, without any coordination problems, without any fumbles, then maybe you don't need to play variations anymore. But as long as there's a little bit of a flaw, I recommend variation practice. The next section begins, this is at letter D, and that is 109 is the measure. There's a little rhythmic thing there, and I'm going to ask you to take a look down at the bottom margin here. I have actually written out how we interpret that turn. See, it's like a tilde. It's a, it means to surround the main note. It's the note itself, the note above, the note itself, the note below. In this case, it's a G sharp. They put the sharp right underneath the turn sign. So it's a five note group. So A, B, A, G, A. And at the last second, we'll play the B. So it's Two, three, two, two, three. Right. So that is a, uh, a lovely lyrical place where we would have, you see um, a mezzo forte. We see these opening and closing of the dynamics. Uh, so that would be uh, to make more sound, we use more bow speed, we add a little bit more weight, we definitely pull the bow closer to the bridge for a bigger sound. Um, then at 113, we have piano. And notice there is a staccato on the 16th note at the end of the second and the fourth beat. And so we have to, in order for the staccato or the articulation to happen, you have to stop and dig in with the bow. We call it biting the string. So stop, catch. And those hooked bows, we call them, I'm stopping the bow and articulating that 16th note that has the staccato over it. Okay, and that is very, very classical. All right, so going on, let's see what else we have on the docket here. Um, so the sustained tied A in measure 109, make sure that you hold the A. Oops, 
<laughs> Here we are. Hold the A, the sustained tied A, for three full beats and then play the turn after the third beat. Isolate shifts. And let's look at, there are two places on the second page where it would be, you can see here, isolate first finger shifts, and you are, oh my gosh, what position are we in? This is the sixth position, and we got there way back at the bottom of the previous page. If I start in measure 127, you will see I'm in third position. This is the measure before E. So that is an A, that is a four finger A, and that is seventh position. Now, to get myself into sixth position, I'm going to use the half step shift between the G and the F sharp that are on the third beat of that measure 128. And that pulls the hand ever so slightly back a half step, and I will then remain in sixth position until measure 135, until the second line of the next page. So all those notes need to be in the sixth position. Let's go one more time. The measure before E. One more time. So I'm in sixth position and I need to, so let me start again at the top of that page. Uh, leading with my first finger. The first finger is what we call the guiding finger. And that's going to delineate where the new position is. And you will see, maybe I should just not play any other notes, but the first finger note. So starting in 135 on the end of the first beat, the, the third note of the triplet, D first finger, C in is the last note of the next beat. B A G. And I can back that up. Let's reverse it. F. Let's repeat in slur. out of context. I'm going to play slower. I'm going to play fewer notes. I'm going to just spotlight the notes that really determine those critical moments of the shift. How about if I play D, E? Now, I've got to go back a step. Even though I'm playing another two, I've got to find one in the, sort of in the blind. Now back. So I've played the first, second, and second of each position. So, So all I have to do then is add the fourth finger and I'm playing the entire passage. Okay, I'm going to start at 134 one more time. So A, the fourth finger is an extension. So not to reach too high, it's kind of, the spaces are small up there. Uh, now four is played by um, the, on the G. So. That 
takes a little bit of repetition and daily to go through the shifting process, pretty soon your hand finds all of those spots. There's another place on this page, a couple, a couple of spots, and I'm looking at measure 150 where we get rid of the triplety thing that we've been doing and we're going to suddenly do an eighth with six sixteenths. In, uh, so that's a, a rhythmic motive that's repeated, but we are shifting up through first, then third, then fifth, then seventh position. This part sounds like... That's first finger, A, the harmonic, and that is seventh position, right? So, let us isolate the shifts again. The most critical point is the seams between the position. If I don't make the jump or the shift into the new position correctly, the next, the coming notes afterwards are not going to be in the right place. So, why don't I do this? Let us take the first beat, and I'm only going to play the B, one and the B4, the octave. Now I'm going to go over to the third measure, third beat, and I'm going to play C, and here's the shift. That one, we know where C is. We've been there a lot. Okay, D, D. So there's no shift on the D, but E, E will be. And that is, I've now entered fifth position, okay? Next measure, F sharp is still in fifth, that octave, then G with two, and now we shift to seventh. And why don't we play a four octave? So we are isolating just those notes that involve the shift. That's a good thing to practice. Why don't we do it slurry? I could do it with a dotted rhythm slurry. How about the little note first? Ah, that makes the shift quicker, because the truth is, that's a pretty fast shift. Why don't I stop my bow also on the eighth note so that it, it will enable, if there is a shift at that point, that the hand can move while the bow is stopped and silent. Okay, so stop, 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 stop. Here I do a half step shift. It gives me a better vibrato finger on the A. Two, 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 three, four, one, two, diminuendo. here in 156, 57, 158, till we get into 159, I see first fingers leading a descending shift pattern down. That's very similar to this that we had up here, wasn't it? So we could just revisit those shifts so that we have confidence that the timing and the feel of those shifts, I've also changed the bowing. So I've moved the slurt over the bar line so that when I shift, I change my bow. And that's kind of okay to do. You know, it's a slight uh, artistic license that I've taken, but it helps it be very crystal clear. That's what classical music is. It's very, it's like fine cut glass. 
it just sparkles. So that is the entire excerpt for the Western, uh, Eastern, Western, <laughs> Regional, or the All-State Orchestra Audition in North Carolina. This is an excellent teaching piece, and there is a, a whole lot of things to learn from it. Um, I hope that you um, have a chance to look at it. So as we go on, there are opportunities for you to reference very fine recordings. You're lucky to have been born at a time when YouTube is free and you have multiple performers, you have a professional performers, you have uh, six-year-olds playing Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, you have uh, From Soup to Nuts, you have uh, people's home recitals, um, um, and college students, all the various levels of amateurs and professionals who care to record themselves and put up their recordings for public consumption. Uh, one such very talented young lady is Jennifer Joan, and she plays the Viotti Concerto with piano accompaniment, which uh, I can play the piano part and I can play the violin part, but I can't play them together at the same time. So what would be really helpful would be for you to listen. Uh, I found Jennifer Joan very easily in YouTube. You can just uh, type in the search bar, Gian Viotti, and it's the very first hit that you will see listed. Um, and she it really is a fine player, young player. Um, and uh, I think that you should listen to her play and uh, try to emulate her tone and her precision. That would be a very good goal to have. Um, I hope that you enjoy, enjoyed our time today. I thank you for coming and listening to my insights on the Viotti and um, also about some of the other things that we talked about. I would like to meet you sometime. Um, and if you're ever in North Carolina in the western part, either skiing in the winter or cooling off in the summer, um, uh, reach out to me and uh, maybe we can get together and say hello and even have a, 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 le a lesson together. So all the best to you and happy practicing. And uh, we hope to see you at Cannon Camp sometime.